Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp is a Canadian-based mineral exploration project generator. The company currently holds multiple property interests in Ontario with joint venture partners and is seeking further joint venture partners for other drill-ready properties in our portfolio. For more information, please visit our website at rmroyalty.com or call me at 604-922-2030. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated. Welcome back to the show, Danielle. Thank you, Jim. Danielle, uh, some interesting articles on your blog of uh, the first one I noticed was the startling consequences of monetary policy. Every time when the Fed cuts rates, when unemployment is below 4%, you get a recession every time. Can we hope for anything different this time around? As some people like to say, this time is different. Well, and the important thing to realize there, it's not the Fed cutting rates that causes the recession. It's all of the excess debt and spending that went on in the preceding period, right? It's the accommodation that allowed people to take on record levels of debt and households and corporations that ultimately slows their consumption ability, that makes them more fragile, that makes them less able to withstand any drop in revenue and income. Um, and that you know, is what sets the whole thing up for everybody having to rationalize costs as revenues start to fall. Pressure comes on, you know, net net profits uh, on free cash flow, and then um, the companies look to start cutting their costs. And that, of course, labor is the largest cost. So once they start laying people off, then the people that you know have uh, less ability to consume now that their income's gone or diminished. Um, have to fall back on savings. Uh, most of them don't have savings or have very little savings. So it's all this fragility that's built up in the previous boom period that ultimately leads to the recession, the downturn, and the spike in unemployment, which is all part and parcel of the same thing. This time, of course, you've got um, the fact that uh, the, the Fed has done everything to extend this cycle. You know, now officially this month it'll be the longest quote-unquote expansion cycle in history of a decade. And you'd think that during that period, people would have used that extension to get in better fiscal shape, right, to build up their savings, to pay down their debt. Unfortunately, they've done the opposite. And so that is why, you know, the the Fed yesterday in the United States didn't cut rates, um, but removed some language that suggested they are prepared to do so in the not-too-distant future, potentially in July. Um, we've already seen, for example, cuts by um, Australia, the Bank of India, the Bank, you know, Russian Central Bank. They've already cut rates because they're responding to a downturn in global demand. This really started in 2018 this time, and um, it has continued for the past many months. Um, so the response of cutting rates is just the Fed finally recognizing that their hopes and dreams about certain levels of inflation, about extending this cycle even longer, about people being able to borrow even more, to consume even more, um, that those hopes and dreams are unfounded because the downturn has already arrived. And if you look at Canada, for example, you know, we had some inflation in our food and durable goods numbers um, today, which suggests that the Bank of Canada you know, on, on inflation targeting, they're supposed to keep inflation around 2% by this rules, these rules that they go by. Um, so there's talk that, you know, well, the Bank of Canada won't have to cut rates now because inflation is above target. The problem is, of course, that as soon as the U.S. Fed starts to cut rates, it's in response to a dramatic downturn in economic data. And, of course, we get pulled down with that because we are so closely connect, connected, being one, their largest trading partner. Um, and we really can't afford at that point to not cut our rates because our dollar uh, appreciates. So already with the Fed slackening their language yesterday and the uh, the inflation data suggesting today that the Bank of Canada may not have to cut rates in the not in the near future, you have an increase in the loonie relative to the U.S. dollar. Well, of course, as the U.S. dollar weakens, um, 
our goods that we're trying to sell them become that more expensive, it's much more difficult for our exports, which are already struggling. Not only that, but um, you see the cost of certain commodities, which are priced in U.S. dollars. So you have the price of oil up dramatically. Um, that's also to do with what's going on in Iran, of course. But you know, the the jump in the price of oil is you know dramatic today. But relatively, you see that um, crude is only back. You know, it's still down 14% since this time last year. Um, it's off 15% since April. So even with these geopolitical stuff going on, even with the weakening U.S. dollar of late, um, we still have a downtrend in um, demand for oil. The growth in oil demand has been downgraded by the IEA. So these things are not, you know, great for Canada. So we can build pipelines and all that stuff to bring our product to uh, the West Coast, but it's not going to provide demand when the global downturn is uh, ongoing and spreading, and we're still in that phase right now. So if you look at, for example, the, the um, yield curves uh, across the world, so even though stocks are bouncing today on this ex- expectation of um, the Fed cutting rates and the stock market delirious, so oh good, they're going to give us more candy, the fact is that, you know, they're already at um, evaluation highs for the stock market and uh, the, the value in terms of investment has been woeful for a long time here. So it's not attractive and making it more expensive doesn't make it attractive and it doesn't provide demand in the world. It can provide, you know, the buyback flow from corporations has kept this gig going. They've been the only net buyer for the last five or six years in the stock market is corporations themselves. And you think, well, great, they've kept the rally going longer than it would have. But there's no free lunch, right? So, yes, they kept the rally going by doing these buybacks. But ultimately, as share prices uh, start to retreat, uh, as costs, start to increase as they get into a cash crunch. They don't have the liquidity to continue to throw, you know, good money after bad by buying overvalued assets in this prestidigitation that they've been doing for the past few years. And then that buying pressure uh, alleviates or starts to diminish and there's no one else to step in because everyone else who is going to buy overvalued assets has already bought overvalued assets, you know. So it's... it's um. If you go back to the bond market, uh, what I was going to say there is that the Bank of Canada at 1.75 is already above every single duration of government bond that we have in Canada all the way out to 30 years, Jim. We have every one of our, uh, you know, the 10, 20, and 30-year bond in Canada today under 1.7%. So that's the bond market saying that, that the central banks have already lost control of this thing, that they're behind the curve, that the recession is already very late likely begun or imminent, that the downturn is global and it's not going to be quickly fixed by anyone cutting a, you know, couple of 2.5, 0.25 uh, amounts off of the overnight front rate. I think the only place it's uh, bucking the trend is Norway apparently today raised its central bank rate and says they see more ahead. Why Norway? Well, Norway has, um, you know, its own sort of... Um, uh, dynamics and they're at a higher interest rate already and they have more inflation in their economy but ultimately you know they're export dependent and the rest of the world is export dependent as well so as soon as you uh, as soon as the rest of the central banks begin cutting rates um, especially led by the US Fed then what happens is currency imbalances start to happen where you know your currency is um, is strengthens against the countries that are cutting and in an export dependent world that becomes very problematic because you're no longer competitive and so you know they, the the commodity centric countries Canada being one of them right uh, is sort of um, holding the line here but as soon as a major economy like the the UK or the euro and uh, the US fed starts to cut, they really don't have any choice but to follow suit. So I think that these other periphery countries will end up doing the same thing. We'll have more with Danielle Park when we return. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. 
surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines. Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Grand Portage Resources Herbert Gold Project in Southeast Alaska highlights increased gold resource indicated and inferred of 860,000 ounces in excess of 10 grams per ton gold. Expansion drilling is planned on the Herbert Gold property for the summer of 2019. Grand Portage Resources trading symbols are GPG on the TSX Venture, GPTRF on the OTCQB, and GPB on Frankfurt. For more information, please visit our website, grandportage.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Danielle Park. Danielle, are Canadian corporations spending way too much money on corporate share buybacks and not enough on research and development? Well, all the com- um, all the companies north and uh, south of the border in the U.S. have been doing this, as I alluded to in the first discussion. There, they've been, you know, the primary net buyer, the only net buyer of stocks, big stocks. Uh, publicly listed companies in the last five or six years, and indeed Canada um, has followed suit. So it's the way that the executive compensation has been structured, where they give them so-called incentives uh, to, you know, performance incentives they call it, but ultimately it's just get your price of stock up and you're going to be paid more, um, and that's a very short-term fixation. It's actually longer-term pretty destructive um, because it, uh, it it incents all these short-term behaviors and malinvestment, which we've seen. So in Canada, um, the 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 chart from the Globe and Mail last weekend was uh, showing the buybacks from TSX-based companies over since 2001, and the parabolic shoot that has gone up straight in the last, say, three years um, is unprecedented. So you can see from that chart that, you know, the, the other thing is that companies like people tend to buy most when prices have already gone up a lot and buy least when prices have gone down, right? So they're always doing the cycle exactly wrong uh, in terms of how to benefit from it, and they're always sort of riding it up buying more as things get more expensive and then holding on over the top and then liquidating after things have fallen and not having cash available to put in when, you know, things go on clearance sale. And companies have been no different in this. So you can see there that they were buying a lot of their own share buybacks in 2007 going into the last downturn and were, you know, almost twice as much now um, in terms of volume of what they've been doing in the last couple of years. And really, this is this is part and parcel of this overall theme, which is we've had a long recovery, but it's been a weak recovery. We've got a slowing in the West in terms of birth rates, in terms of demand, in terms of baby boomers getting older, in terms of people being able to spend because they've got this debt weight around them, the young and the old. All those things are deflationary, ultimately, and so the the whole point is that productivity has suffered greatly in this expansion because every time you add more debt and you know more ability to surf the web and look at uh, gifts and and social media stuff, the less productive the population becomes. So you're not really getting a lot of bang for the buck, even though this cycle has gone on so long. We've had very anemic growth rates. We've had very weak income gains. So all those things are the things that would actually engender the ability to have an extended cycle organically, right? If people could get wage gains, if they could have savings to draw down, um, those things could fuel uh, consumption even you know, longer, but we are at the end of that road because none of that has happened this time, right? We've had um, all the sort of negative consequences of too much debt in the system. So um, what's happening now is companies really didn't have any great ideas because ultimately some of the status quo business models, whether it's the ice engine cars, whether it's the, you know, oil sector, uh, whether it's the big food systems, whether it's, you know, all these status quo uh, businesses, ultimately are at a crossroads where technology is challenging um, and taking them into a the next theme. The next theme is going to be, you know, um, one of smarter and faster and um, smaller, basically miniaturization and being able to do processes for more for less, which I've talked about before. So all of that requires actually long-term vision and investment, and that's sort of the kind of thing that, 
present shareholders or boards of, of directors, everyone's so fixated on the short term. How do we get, how do we get the price of the share up quick? And not on these long-term investment things, or they look at their business model and think, all we can see is is less demand for this product or this service going forward. Um, we would have to reinvent ourselves, or reinvent our product, or invest heavily in outfitting our factories to create a new line of product or the next evolution of technology. And to do that is capital intensive and not necessarily good for short term um, earnings and short term, you know, uh, ability to return cash to shareholders, which has been the whole obsession this cycle. So because of that. They haven't invested in these longer-term rejuvenation of their business um, that would take them into the next growth phase, and they've squandered a lot of the capital that they did have coming in in the past few years in these short-term gimmicks. So, yes, Canada has been doing it just as much um, as the the U.S., although, you know, are on a smaller scale in our companies, but the the... the the end result is the same, is that we have, you know, not much to show for all this extended cycle. And the money that's been spent and the debt that's been taken on has not um, got us a lot in terms of setting us up for the next big boom phase. Now, you know, unfortunately, humans tend to learn from pain and be forced only when they run out of other easy options. So I think that this next downturn is going to, you know, it's going to, take a, a big whack off of share prices. It's going to show them, just like GE has recently learned, you know, that all the shares they were buying back at $25 a share was a really bad financial decision now that their shares are just uh, north of $10 a share. You know, it's the absolute best way to evaporate money is to take it and buy back assets that are overvalued and have them fall. So I think we're going to learn all that again this cycle, just as we did in 2008. However, this time, you know, as I say, uh, it, it, it's even more so. Is it time to ban the buying of your own shares again? I think that we need very strict rules around it. I think that we need to incent people on the debt side. So, for example, if we started paying executives in their bonds of their company, you would see a completely different approach to their asset management, which would be, you know, how do we keep the balance sheet strong? How do we make the bonds more valuable? Not how do we print more junk debt uh, and buy paper that's, uh, you know, basically like a Ponzi scheme to keep the share price going up? How do we actually invest in the long-term strength and, and viability of the operations? Um, that's the, the incentives that we really... Because there's so much great opportunity here, Jim. There's so many new things that are coming, um, whether it's nanotechnology, whether it's 3D printing, whether it's autonomous vehicles, whether it's the 5G build-out. I mean, there are so many things that are exciting going on, the revolution of the food system. I mean, the, there's massive opportunities here, but we've got to get people fixated on longer-term projects than just quarter to quarter. And so that is where the difficulty is right now. President Trump suggested that companies only report every, what, six months, nine months instead of quarterly. Would that make a difference in how they did their business plans? Uh you know, it, it, less transparency is typically not a good thing, um, and I would argue that Mr. Trump is the l less transparency poster child here, and that's mostly because, I, you know, I like to say that the, that the less transparency is often just a cloak for more deceit. Um, so I think it's good that they have uh, clear and regular reporting of their results, um, they do have to retrain investors. I think many people today that are so-called investors are actually not investors at all. They want to get lots of cash flow up front. They want all quick bucks being, you know, compensated early. Whereas investing is really about a longer term time frame, about people putting in money, you know, for future, um, projects and benefits and, and, uh, development that will pay off over time, not necessarily in the first quarter or two that you uh, buy the, the share or the debt of the company. And so um, we've really got this. Um, it comes from this whole business about, you know, whether the only object of management should be to make shareholders, uh, compensate shareholders, you know, and that's actually a very self-destructive model. Um, and that's only been in since about the 70s that we've sort of migrated towards this idea that the, the companies, all their, all their only purpose is to get the share price up because ultimately that's very destructive and we've seen that time and again. So 
the, the, the whole purpose of a business should be to build wealth over time, to serve customers, to serve employees, to, you know, um, create jobs. Um, there's a whole bunch of stakeholders there, right, to tr- help the help the economy grow, to help governments with tax dollars coming in. Those are all very legitimate purposes for the capitalist model, for having, you know, free enterprise. But if it's not fixated or incented on long-term investment and it's all about quick schemes and gambling, it's a very self-destructive and very destructive in the society as, as a whole. We'll have more with Danielle Park right after this. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite enriched gold bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Danielle Park. Danielle, is the Canadian pension plan well-managed? Oh, so here here it is, um, you know, in a nutshell, right? So, Yes, we've done some things well. For example, in 2000, we created a separate fund. We didn't just fund it out of general revenues, general tax revenues anymore, like they've done with Social Security, which, by the way, is slated to run out of money completely within the next uh, 10 years, 10 to 15 years. So this is um, a very serious problem where, again, this whole generation of people got away from the idea of saving for future spending needs and uh, assumed we could just fund everything out of income, right? So this has been a big problem with the, the, the whole mindset of the last several decades and the baby boomers, et cetera. So instead of saving for future, they kept funding it out of, out of uh, income spending. So in Canada, we did fix that. In around 2000, we said, okay, the government said we're going to set aside a separate pot we're going to have people pay into it, and that is going to be where the pensions come from. So that's all excellent. Unfortunately, what's happened is that with the low rate environment, as rates came down um, since 2000, they've been coming down well, actually before that, but in particular since 2008 when we got into this zero interest rate style environment and yields on you know savings deposits, government bonds, all that went sub 2%. Pensions were, um, you know, the correct answer, and the conservative government actually had this right, uh, was that they need to um, restructure the plan so that people start taking out of it later, not not at 65, but maybe 67, 68, 70. And then once you decide that, you look at the pool of people that are going to be taking out, you know, you know what income uh, credits they have gained in their working career, what the payouts are expected to be, and then you have to figure out how to top up contributions. But no one wanted to top up contributions. So what they did is, you know, the Liberal government came in, they rolled it back to 65 as the start date. That was very populist. Unfortunately, the math doesn't work. And so what they did to the managers, they said, okay, I tell you what, how about you, the great Oz, go and make us more money with this pot than is than is safely possible? How about we let you gamble with it and see if you can win us extra money in the pot? And so, indeed, they've hired a team. Since 2006, they've act, moved to what they call an active strategy, but really that's just code word for a lot more risk. They went into a lot more illiquid things you know, private equity and um, different uh, uh, real estate properties and things that can't necessarily be sold quickly if needs must, but, you know, their thesis was that they could make higher returns there. So in order to do this, though, the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board has, you know, uh, did a increase their staff by tenfold in the last 13 years. Their transaction costs... Um, uh, 44 times. So operating costs on the plan itself went from 1.2 um, 
went to $1.2 billion, which is 22 times more than they were in 2006. And you think, holy cow, if you're spending all this much more and you're feeding all these more people to be managers and the team to help this active management plan, surely you're going to get much better results. Well, the answer is that by the CPP's only, uh, their, their actual report, um, they've beaten their reference portfolio or their benchmark by an average of 0.6 annually. Now, that adds up to real money over time. The trouble is that they are now up to their neck, literally the equivalent of about 85% equity because they have, you know, if it's 50, 56% of the portfolio is actually in equity. But when you look at the infrastructure, real estate, these non-liquid instruments and, and projects that they're holding, they acknowledge that they're risk equivalent to about 85% weight in equities. So if you look at that, if you, ha- you have to, I guess, use as a, as a point of reference, you have to appreciate that back in the 1950s when these pensions were first being set up, um, the 50s and 60s, the, it was acknowledged that they had to keep the risk extremely low because they were guaranteeing an income payout over a certain period of time for all these people. And so 96% of pension assets used to be held in fixed income bonds, right, with principal guarantees, dates of maturity, regular income state p- payments that would be every six months. Cash and liquidity and fixed income was all the priority in the inception of these pension plans. Well, fast forward to today, and we have now 85% of them held in these highly liquid, highly risky bets. And so you may say, well, you know, it's worked out. But it's only worked out during this extended bull run period. As we saw in 2008, when the Canadian stock market dropped by half, the pension plans, including the CPP, had a negative a negative effect and it took them several years to recover thereafter. So the same thing, you know, what if we're 10 years into this expansion, the longest ever in history, and central banks are about to start cutting and every single time they've started cutting when in when we've been this late in the cycle, you it, it marks the onset of recession and whenever you get a recession, you also get a bear market in financial assets. Uh, and in this time, probably in real estate as well in Canada, because we've now got this very correlated uh, connection between our inflated realty and our inflated stock market. So you can imagine the kind of hit a fund could take when they're 85% exposed and can't sell this stuff easily to downside, to down, uh, reduce that exposure heading into this perfect storm of financial calamity. Um, so my point is, that it's looked like progress, but at the end of the day, as the Financial Post article correctly points out, you know, once this this mean reversion um, takes place in financial markets and asset prices, where will our funding structure be then? And by then, you've already paid out these, you know, billions more in fees over the last 13 years, and you won't be able to get that money back. So it's like, you know, it's like you've 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 gambled. And it looks like you're winning at this strategy. But as all gamblers should know, ultimately your luck changes. And when your luck changes, you lose a ton, right? And so I'm concerned that we are going to be just like we were in 2000 and 2000, just like we were in 2008 where you looked at asset markets. They went back to the levels they'd been in 1996 and 7, Jim. So if we're in a similar or potentially more uh, – risk exposed environment today, you could see asset markets retrace the levels that they were at the late 90s. And we're going to be fully exposed to that and that much older in the population, that many more people already trying to take out income from the CPP fund and from all the other retirement plans and accounts and RSPs and everything that people have. They're going to be trying to withdraw income and just as assets plunge and then there's not a lot of liquidity or extra cash to use because we've got less contributions going in from the workforce behind them to top up the, the money needed. So this is why this is a bad way to manage it, but it is the way that in the short term, everyone has sort of plugged their ears and hummed, right, and hoped that this very, very high-risk strategy would continue winning indefinitely. And as I like to say, that's just, um, you know, a fool's errand. And also, if you're looking for Wizard of Oz, we all know that in the end, the Wizard of Oz was this, you know, this uh, person hiding behind a curtain that wasn't magical at all, right? And unfortunately, I think that's what people are going to learn. 
Danielle, thank you so much for chatting with us. Hey, thank you, Jim. My guest has been Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog, Juggling Dynamite. If you have any questions for Danielle or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Find us on Twitter at How Street, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.